Kamara Hashiv Makarajan, Smisha Indra Grim McKinnick, Agus Hami Yola Ki Yachtri Nagel Tacht. Uh, how you doing, my friends? I'm Andrew Grant McKenzie and I'm the Highland Historian. Um, if you'd like to book me for lectures, tours or um, or for any research purposes, um, do contact me at andrew at highlandhistorian.com and for more information, go to highlandhistorian.com as well. Um, so today we're going to be having a look at um, a, a lecture that I first gave in February 2018 um, and that was in commemoration of the Rite of Moy. Uh, more on that later on in, in, the, in the lecture. Um, but the, the title today is Nothing Could Be stranger than the saga of Donald Ban McCrimmon. So the, the title itself is actually a quote from uh, a guy called Alistair Campsey. Next we're going to move on to um, someone who's had a, a very positive impact in my life, uh, my piping tutor Andrew McLennan and the reason for that is because we have some fantastic piping coming up in this program um, which I hope you'll, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy as much as I do um, and I am not good enough to play these pipe tunes, so I had to get somebody else, and that happened to be Andrew McLennan. Um, so, as I say, he's my, my piping uh, tutor, but also he is, um, well, we're very fortunate to, to have his piping on this, um, on this program, because he is the unofficial world record holder for the longest continuous pipe. Now... That sounds quite complicated. Um, the reason I've said it's unofficial is because of the bu bureaucracy uh, of pa paperwork um, that you have to go through uh, in order to get a Guinness World Record these days. So hopefully at some point that will take place and Andrew will officially become the Guinness World Record holder. Um, and the, the continuous pipe that he did lasted for 26 hours, 57 minutes and 38 seconds absolutely phenomenal now i can guarantee that andrew did get that record because i was there for the whole thing and i took 13 minutes of sleep in that time so i witnessed pretty much the entire thing the 13 minutes of sleep i took was during one of the periods when he was allowed a 15 minute break um and so how it works is it's not a continuous continuous pipe um but every hour you're allowed five minutes um and every few hours you're allowed i, th I think up to a 15 minute break it was um in order to eat change your clothing um, change your bagpipes as you can see in the photograph on the slide here um, uh, he's, he's had to have lots of different pipes at the front of the the desk when he was doing the uh, uh, the piping um, it took place in a, um, a bar called Hoot Nannies in Inverness um, upstairs which is called Mad Hatters um, so you can see that in the picture as well um, and in that time you, you're allowed to change your clothing uh, eat some food go to the toilet anything you need to do to survive but when you consider that it's only technically five minutes every hour for 26 hours, 57 minutes, 38 seconds, that simply isn't enough time. Uh, so the, the record was phenomenal to witness. Um, and I, I really do hope that uh, sometime soon Guinness uh, will, will grant him the official world record as well. So a bit more about Andrew. He's originally from Akhilti Bui. Uh, Andrew is constantly teaching chanter and encouraging youngsters to take up the art of piping, as well as organising the Drum the Rocket Pipe Band, uh, performing in Hootenannies, as I said, uh, a bar in Inverness every Monday evening. So if you do come on a Highland Historian tour, um, you could fit that in as part of the itinerary. Um, and fixing, selling and being the go-to man for any repairs to bagpipes in Cabafé bagpipes. Andrew has been playing chanter um, himself since he was five years old um, and he was taught by the late pipe major Norman Gillis. Now for those of you who know piping and I'm aware that many of you will, um, the Gillis family will need absolutely no introduction. Um, pipe major Norman Gillis and his son pipe major Alistair Gillis were two of the most decorated solo pipers of all time. Um, Alistair Gillis uh, was, was a phenomenal uh, piper in, in piping competitions, um, also pipe major um, in, the, in the Highlanders regiment as well, Queen, Queen's Own I believe, and into the Highlanders as well, um, which is, is very unusual in itself. Um, uh, and Pipe Major Gillis um, unfortunately uh, passed away, um, so we, we don't now have him, um, but on YouTube, if you do look for him, you can find some of his uh, phenomenal competition performances, uh, both at Inverness and Oban. Um, 
So they were they were two of the most decorated pipers of all time, and Alistair's son, Norrie Gillis, is already set to fo follow in their footsteps, having joined the pipe band of Four Scots Royal Regiment of Scotland, um, who then immediately won several pipe band competitions uh, after his inclusion. Most recently, in November 2019, um, we saw him at the Cenotaph, um, piping with, with other pipers from Four Scots as well. Um, he is a phenomenal piper in his own right, um, and I, I look forward to seeing much more from him in future years as well. Um, so in my opinion, the Gillis family are on a level close to par with the McCrimmons, and that is a huge thing to say, um, given the um, audacity that the McCrimmons have in, in piping history, in piping legend, in piping folklore as well. Um, and we will discuss a little bit of that in this, this lecture. Um, but it's my belief that the, the Gillis family... Um, uh, which, you know, the, the Gillis film family is still progressing, still developing in piping. Um, I, I believe that they, they will um, stand the test of time um, and, and it's something phenomenal to witness, basically. Um, I'm still trying to prove a link through Andrew's tutelage dynasty back to the McCrimmons, but I'm almost certain that there is one. Um, if an as yet unproven claim on a website about Norman Gillis taking a Peebrook lesson from pipe major Donald MacLeod of the Seaforth Highlanders um, can be shown to be true. Uh, but that's perhaps a tale for another day, but it's certainly something of interest to me because it gives me pr great pride, um, not only uh, in, in having such a good piping tutor who's brought me onto the pipes so early in my in my learning, um, but also to have that historical connection um, in my uh, piping tutelage dynasty uh, going back. My interest in piping, so it is more than a passing interest. I hope you've um, kind of figured that out from my other video videos so far. Um, but uh, it all stems from a visit to to this place, the old uh, schoolhouse in in Borrerig on Skye. My first trip to Borrerig um, was on a wet and midge-ridden day in August 1997, and. In August 1997, this old schoolhouse was then uh, the Museum of Piping and the McCrimmons. It was actually run by a con man and uh, a criminal as well. Um, this guy had set up a museum. He'd taken money um, from uh, various uh, different things. I, I believe Highland Council was one of the, the funders of the museum. Um, and he'd also taken orders uh, for lots of military pipe band equipment for, for several regiments in the in the British Army um, and none of that materialised um, and then he'd also set up other uh, companies in England, in Spain I believe and I think one in Portugal as well, I'm not quite sure um, and I believe they caught up with him um, through an address in Devon but he was in Spain or something, there, there's some um, a story about that that, that um, uh, I've, I've tried to piece together um, it's difficult to piece it together, but um, I have heard various versions of the story from locals um, in, in bars on Sky and also in tourist information on Sky as well. Um, and, and it's very interesting. Um, uh, but I am um, proud of my, my uh, meeting with this man because at the age of 11, um, he gave me my first chance to, to play the pipe drones and I marched around the old schoolhouse very proudly playing his, his pipes. Um, and then I wanted to buy a chanter. Um, and that chanter is still the chanter that I use to this day, um, or one, one of my uh, practice chanters. It's a plastic chanter, um, which if you come on tour um, with Highland Historian, it's my Land Rover chanter. And so I went up to him and he tried to get me to, to pay on card. And I said, no, 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 I'd like to, to pay all of my, my pocket money stash, um, you know, emptied out my pockets onto this desk. Um, and it seemed I didn't have enough money. Um, but apparently he was um, uh, either impressed with my, my drone playing, which was probably dreadful in all, all honesty, um, or he was impressed with my um, uh, efforts uh, to, to get a discount and he gave me a £3 discount. So I'm quite proud of that, actually. Um, when I got home, uh, my school refused to bring in a pipe tutor. So my, my learning of the chanter um, became something I, I tried and pretty much failed at as a, as a, as a child. Um, so 
it then got left for, for quite a long time and in 2017 um, I decided to put right the lack of bagpipe playing in my life and I cont contacted Andrew McLennan through Facebook um, and I began attending lessons in Cabafé piping supplies in the Victorian market on Monday lunchtimes. Um, this was when I was seconded away from um, Culloden Battlefield and I was working in Valnane House um, as, the, as the archivist for the North West um, uh, Highlands um, uh, region. Uh, for National Trust for Scotland. So it's safe to say that um, piping uh, for me was definitely more than a passing interest and when I asked uh, Andrew to, to find a set of pipes for me um, we, we we discussed what, what kind of pipes I'd like, what kind of tone I would like from them um, and I, I basically said I, I want a set of pipes that I'm going to be proud of for the rest of my life um, and you, you've heard and seen those in, in my other videos if you haven't yet uh, please subscribe to the channel and you can go and have a look at those uh, those videos as well um and he, he told me that it would take years to find a set of pipes like that um and so i thought oh well you know m maybe i'll never get them you know whatever um and it just so happened that the the set of pipes that i did end up purchasing were on the floor in a box right next to us when we had that discussion and it took um a few weeks to to uh, realize that um and when we did the the case um uh turned turned out to have a tag on it that simply said sky pipes um so yeah for me the connection to sky and piping is is very very strong as well um so yeah more than a passing interest and it's something that i'll i'll continue for a long time under uh, andrew's um tutelage as well i'm sure um so we have a family tree here um this this family tree will be well known to to many of you um uh who who know bagpiping um it's the family of the McK uh, mccrimmons um the the there is uh, lots of uh, folklore legend but also good history about the the mccrimmons as well uh, we know that they were a they were a, um, a, a teaching family um and that they taught um, many um of the uh, the best pipers in scotland um uh, as well as many pipers to chiefs um and, and households throughout scotland as well people were, were sent to them for piping we'll speak a bit more about that later but from this family tree the the important thing to pick up on here is that the the uh, people in darker blue um are the hereditary pipers to the um uh to the mcleod's chiefs uh, so mcleod of dunvegan mcleod of mcleod and what you can see is that donald ban mccrimmon was not the hereditary piper and he was not the piper to mcleod he was the younger brother of Malcolm, who was the hereditary piper to MacLeod. Um, so we, we have to iron that out um, before we start. Um, so the McCrimmons, this this slide is uh, a, a picture of the um, the the cairn uh, at, at Borrerig on Skye near the old schoolhouse. Um, that's my chanter sitting there, which I took there um, to try and get some sort of luck um, uh, and, and some uh, good fortune from from the the uh, fairies of Borrerig, I suppose. Um, and the McCrimmon story has mysterious beginnings. Many people have tried to unpick it. I'm not going to try and unpick it, uh, but I will tell you a couple of the, the variants of the stories. Uh, one of them is that uh, the the McCrimmons um, got the uh, the piping from a big ploughman of Isla, um, and this big ploughman was sat there um, uh, playing playing one day, and uh, he had a, a black chanter, and a Macdonald heard him, um, and he said, "Oh, you're you're really good. Um, I'll I'll send you to McCrimmon for lessons." Um, and it eventually happened that he somehow taught the McCrimmons how to play. Who knows? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting story. I've heard many variants on that story. Bridget McKenzie um, uh, has has a very good uh, uh, go at that that story, um, and it exists in in various forms, both in Isla and in Sky as well. Um, it's not unlikely that a, a big ploughman on Isla um, brought brought his piping to to Sky more than possible um but uh it's more likely that that person um was either spotted by mcleod rather than mcdonald 
or that it was actually a MacArthur who was spotted by a McDonald because the MacArthurs were the, the piping family to the McDonald's and the McCrimmons were the piping family to the McLeods. Um, so yeah, um, there's a little bit of uh, um, uh, picking to do on that historically. Um, but the, the most famous of the traditions is that the McCrimmons got their piping from the Isla Fairies. Now, fairies and what fairies are is something that I intend to do a lot more work on um, and I will will put, put up a, a few videos about that work uh, in the future as well but to give it a, a, a very quick go over fairies in in Gallic tradition um, tend to be traveling uh, 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 beings if you like um, so they go from one place to another, they take skill sets with them, they, they do uh, good things uh, for people and when they're not paid they do bad things to people. So fairies take on a bad um, element as well. Uh, so Isla fairies, well, they could be connected to Vikings, they could be connected to McIntyres, McEachans, uh, uh, or, or MacArthur's themselves as well. Um, so it could be somebody from an outside um, uh, culture, an outside family, an outside tradition that came into Sky and brought with them that skill of piping. So this whole fairy tradition thing could actually stand up historically. Um, but we'll, we'll look at that another time. I'm not going to say that that's, um, that's my conclusion on it, but it's, it's possible. Um, there was also a lot of uh, Western Pipers. Um, they, the, there's many, many different families, uh, the Rankins, the McGregors. Uh, McGregors maybe not quite as Western as other, uh, as other families. There was the MacArthurs and, of course, the McCrimmons. Um, there was also sc uh, schools on both Isla and Mull, as well as, as uh, the MacArthur and the, the McCrimmon schools on Sky. Um, so piping was obviously a big thing uh, in, in the West um, and, and on the, the islands as well. So um, piping culture, piping traditions went round um, and people travelled with it as well. Uh, whatever the truth, the McCrimmons developed a style that was clearly unmatched. And it's because of that that they've been recorded in our history as the, the people who really developed Peabrook, which is the what we now see as the traditional style of piping, where you take a ground and then you develop various variations from that ground. Um, quite often it would be the, the ground is like a tune um, and then you, you develop at the intensity of the tune right up um, to, to uh, uh, lots of um, variations, movements, speeds, uh, various things like that. And then you return to the ground. And the whole purpose of a full pibrich is to give an idea of, um, of eternity. So the, the tune goes round and round and round um, and it, it's mood music. So we'll, we'll hear a little bit of that uh, later on in the, this lecture. Um, but the McCrimmons are most closely associated with, with what we now think of as, as the traditional style of piping, uh, the Peabrook uh, style of piping. Um, so in the, the 1600s, uh, the, the McCrimmons, they, they were based in, in uh, Bororig on Sky from 1500 and they were certainly um, teaching from, from the 1500s onwards. Uh, but in the 1600s, pipers were certainly coming to Sky from as far as Perthshire uh, for their, their tutelage. Um, and they, they were incredibly important um, because of that. So we can see here uh, a quotation. Um, uh, on on the, the slide here um, is from John Campbell, Earl of Bredalban uh, to his Chamberlain Campbell of Bacaldang um, on the 22nd of April 1697 and it says give McIntyre ye piper 40 pounds Scots as his apprenticeship with McCrumen till May next as also provide him in what cloths he needs and dispatch him immediately to the Isles lucky man he uh, got 40 quid and a new set of clothes. And it, it's one of these examples um, of how important piping was uh, to, to a household. Um, this is a very rich um, uh, person sending their piper uh, to, to the McCrimmons on Sky um, during, uh, of course, the Jacobite period, 1697. Um, so the Jacobite period really starts in Scotland in 1689. Um, and... Yeah, it's 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 obviously an important thing. Uh, the school was not formally recorded until Padraig uh, McCrimmon, Donald Ban's father, um, who 
is seen as the person who set up the school uh, in in the mid to late 1600s. So um, I've already said that they were more than likely uh, uh, teaching uh, piping on, on Sky from the, the 1500s. That's what it says on the cairn at, at Borrerig. That's what's recorded in the um, in, in the uh, the folklore traditions um, of, of the McCrimmons. Um, but we don't have a definite um, sign of it until the mid to late 1600s. And this quotation is one of the, the earliest um, uh, examples of that. Uh, the MacArthur, Mac MacArthur's were certainly already teaching in the south of Sky, uh, probably before um, the, the McCrimmons. Um, and the, the possible earliest record of payment for McCrimmon tutelage um, is, is this quotation of the 40 pounds uh, that, that was sent um, uh, to be paid for, uh, for the piping. Um, so it's an incredibly important quote and it gives us a starting point um, for, for the, the McCrimmon story, really. Um, so Borrerig, the, the houses um, uh, that, that remain uh, um, at, at Borrerig are few and far between. Um, and those are um, uh, unfortunately um, fairly well destroyed. You can see them in the, the image on the slide there. Um, and... You know, it, it shows that there was obviously a township in Borrerig at one time. Um, you can only imagine the scenes. Um, I presume it was a, a bustling township uh, with lots of people going about playing pipes. Um, you know, there would have been uh, families in each of the little houses. You know, it, it's hard to imagine now, though. It's hard to imagine and it's quite sad to, to, to go there and see it. Um, but the uh, sighting for the houses was absolutely ideal. It was an ideal place. It was a, um, a good uh, um, level area. Uh, good for housing, good for, for crops, good for, um, for, for, for cattle as well. Um, and also the most interesting part of the, the area of Borrerig is that it's got lots of caves. And the caves were ideal for pipers to go and practice in, especially in wet weather, which you get a lot of on Sky, but also ideal um, to, to tune into the drones. And, and when you listen to Peabrook, um, you have to understand that a piper could spend days playing in a, a cave, you know, playing these Peabrook tunes in a cave, um, just to perfect each and every variation of, of the tunes, um, just to perfect the sound, the tuning, um, the tone of the, the pipes that they play. Um, and, and you can only just imagine um, how that must have been. But Borrerig, um, because of those caves, is, is an ideal place for a, for a piping school. So the, the situation in itself um, is what would have drawn many of the students uh, to, to go there as well. Now, there are a lot of compositions that we still have by McCrimmons, um, but I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. I may do another video on this, but um, piping history uh, changed dramatically from the mid to late uh, 1700s. Um, and, and in the 1820s, um, uh, piping and, and Peabrook itself um, possibly changed, but it, it's very difficult to prove how much it changed and in, in what order it changed. But it became something that was done in competitions. And so they had to have rules and they had to have um, uh, written variations of, of the music as well. Um, so a lot of these compositions are, are recorded in several variations, several um, editions of, of Pibrex. Um And uh, some of them are, are recorded in counteract. Some of the, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. And some of them are recorded in notation um, and, and counteract or just in notation. So um, there is clearly a lot of tunes that were composed by, by McCrimmons um, and, and all of them today are still famous uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the pipe competition circuit. Um, so if you go to, to the Oban um, or Inverness Peabrook competitions, um, which happen each year, you will certainly hear at least one of those or see one of the, one of those tunes on the lists of tunes. Um, they, they're, you know, very, very well known tunes, um, incredible pieces of music. Um, and, and they really are uh, the, the classical music of, of the bagpipe. Um, one, one that I'm picking out from there as, as one of my favourites is The Lament for Mary MacLeod. And if you search that on um, 
uh, on on YouTube, you'll you'll find lots of variations of it. Um, uh, but it's it's one that stands out from other Peabrooks because it's very unusual in it, in its own right. Um, and for that reason, it's it's one of my um, preferred ones actually. So the McCrimmons clearly had a lasting impact on on bagpipe history. Um, they clearly had a lasting impact on on composition um, of of bagpipe music. And that still lasts to this day very, very strongly. So whatever you believe about the, the legend of the McCrimmons, there is fact that goes with it as well. And that is that piping has been um, changed and has survived enormously as a result of the, the, um, the, the work of the McCrimmon family, if you like. We're now going to have a listen to one of the, the pipe tunes that is um, closely associated with the, uh, the McCrimmons. It, it's not the, the Peabrook version of this tune, uh, there is a Peabrook version as well, um, but the, the tune is um, uh, McCrimmon Will Never Return and of course it's Andrew McLennan playing the pipes, you can hear that in the background now. Um, it appears as you can see from the, um, uh, the, the image on the uh, the slide here, that it appears in the Campo Cantaract. Uh, that's the written version of the, the score that you see. Um, now, Campo Cantaract um, is, is very important in, in our understanding of older pipe tunes. Um, it is not musical notation, as you can see, um, and it's basically the words that would be used to describe the, the notes and the movements on the pipe uh, to, to a student. Um, so the... the, um, the uh, the pipe tutor would, would sort of sing the tune if you like and do, ro, din, um, that's not the, the tune that you're hearing but um, th those words basically mean the uh, the variations, the, uh, the movements on the chanter that you would have to play and so you'd be able to play it back once you knew how to sing it in, in counteract. Um, and it appears in the 1790s uh, Campbell counteract as uh, I Shall Never Return um, that's the, the name uh, that, it, that is given to it there. Uh, the Campbell Cantaract uh, was written by Colin Campbell of Netherlawn, who was um, a, a very interesting person in his own right, very, very important to, to piping uh, um, uh, history and knowledge because of the Campbell Cantaract. There were three volumes, one of them has been lost, people are still trying to find it, um, but two volumes do exist, I believe, in the, the National uh, Library of Scotland, um, and uh, they, they're incredibly important documents um, uh, for, for, for our modern knowledge of the history of piping. Um, but he was actually the son of somebody who um, I, I'd like to do a bit more work on in the future as well and, and do look out for that. Um, his father was Donald Campbell Peabeth Moore Macaglasrich um, and he was one of the few people who was noted as being a piper in the Jacobite army of 1745-1746 um, and he was also the preferred piper of uh, Charles Edward Stuart. Um, Peabeth Moore means the great piper and Macaglasrich means son of the vegetables which I love that name, um, there must be a story behind that, uh, clearly had something to do with, with growing vegetables. Um, uh, so yeah, very very interesting uh, person in his own right, um, and I'll, I'll certainly be doing some more um, uh, research on him. He was a, a member of McDonnell of uh, Kepik's regiment. Um, the, the tune itself is also known as Hatil Mechruman, and that's the version that you're hearing here. Um, and this tune was uh, apparently a result of, um, of Second Sight. So uh, before the MacLeods left to join the Redcoat Army, Donald Ban was asked by MacLeod of the Vegan to play the gathering tune, the MacLeod Salute. Um, this was written by Donald Moore McCrimmon, Donald Ban's great-grandfather, so that was in the, the list of tunes that, that, that you saw previously. Um, but instead of playing MacLeod's salute um, to, to gather the clan, he decided uh, instead to play something off the top of his head, apparently. Um, and this uh, so happened to be McCrimmon Will Never Return. Um, his mood was the thing that did not let him play the gathering tune and instead he played this tune which relayed the move, mood of his prophecy that he would never return uh, once he left um, with, the, um, with the, the regiment of MacLeod's. Question though, was this actually Donald Bam? As we've already seen, he was not the hereditary piper to MacLeod. Um, why was his elder brother Malcolm, hereditary piper, not playing the gathering tune? 
Um, is this the first of many confusions between the two? And it could well be the case that, that uh, Donald Ban and Malcolm uh, McCrimmon um, were, were actually, um, you know, sometimes occasionally mistaken for each other. So we'll, we'll get on to the confusion between uh, Donald Ban and his brother Malcolm a little bit later on. Um, but just to, to very quickly have a look at another area of research that I'm hoping to develop over, over the coming years. Um, bagpiping 1689 to 1746. Um, there's a lot uh, that we could know about this. Um, but there's also an awful lot that we don't know about this. Um, so it's a, a big, big area of research. Um, but a lot of our um, um, preconceptions about uh, bagpiping, its place in the Jacobite period, and on which side it was most prevalent, um, could be open to, to big debates and big questions. Um, and this lecture is, is actually part of that. And you'll find out why um, a little bit later on. Um, so, uh, Joseph MacDonald, um, uh, the, the book that you see in the image there, is, is probably one of our most important resources for, um, for piping in that period. This was, of course, written after that period, though, 1689 to 1746. Um, this was written in 1760. Uh, but Joseph MacDonald's book, uh, when it was written in 1760, it was written on a ship uh, to India before he died at home uh, um, in Calcutta uh, of a malignant fever in May 1763. Um, so it's it's um, sort of one of the last things that he ever did was write this book. Um, and without this record, we would know very little about bagpiping during the period 1689 to 1746. Um, it gives us a, a sense of um, how practice was done, what kind of bagpipes were being played. You can see an image there of a three drone bagpipe with um, the big bell uh, um, tops for the um, for the for the drones there uh, that was drawn by Joseph MacDonald in that book um, but we also know from his book that the two drone bagpipe was um, was preferred in some areas and the three drone bagpipe was quite a new thing um, we, we, we can learn all sorts of things from from Joseph Joseph MacDonald's work um, it's 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 still relatively new in this period as a profession as such. Um, so the, the, the Pipers, um, the McCrimmons, are, are starting to teach people for households. Um, those people are being given clothes. We've already seen that. They're also being given discounts on their rents. Um, and and it's, it's quite a new thing um, in that, that sense. Um, bagpipes in battle would probably have been played by ordinary fighting men. But uh, before this period and also actually during this period as well. Um, it's, it's quite rare to have people as named pipers. We've already seen one, Peabeth Moore, Michael Glasserick on the Jacobite side, but there, there are far more on the, the that we can name as, as um, uh, actual serving pipers on the Hanoverian side. Uh, two of those are Donald Ban McCrimmon and also his brother Malcolm. Um, so we already know that. Um, the, uh, the the pipers we think of as military pipers uh, were more likely pipers of a household who, who were with their laird or master in the regiment, and that's certainly the case for the MacLeods here. Um, Campbell of Argyll's regiment, a predecessor to Loudoun's 64th Highlanders, um, was one of the first to have a named professional piper, and that was Hugh Mackenzie, who played at the Glencoe Massacre in 1692. Um, Loudoun's 64th Highlanders were a regiment that against the romantic view, probably did more to save Gallic traditions um, and create the military piping tradition we now know uh, than they have been historically given credit for. Now, that's a, a big thing to say, and it's a big thing to debate and also research um, uh, for me in the future as well. But I, I believe that um, a lot of the, the current modern way of viewing bagpiping in military um, uh, service um, actually emanates from uh, from Loudoun's 64th Highlanders, a regiment that only existed from the year 1745 to 1746. Um, quite a remarkable thing, um, but it but it seems to come from that the the way that they used pipers. Um, this is part of a topic um, that, that I, I'm I'm going to be looking into um, uh, in in much greater detail in future. The question here is: uh, Was Donald Ban actually a professional regimental piper? 
um, and his brother Malcolm, his his master's hereditary piper. Um, I mean, that's an interesting and significant thing because um, his his brother Malcolm would have been there regardless of whether he was a professional uh, piper in the military or not, because his 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 master was there, and um, so he would have followed on and and played the pipes wherever he went. But it seems interesting that Donald Ban is actually not with MacLeod. He's actually put into another um, uh, group, um, an another independent company, um, and he's there to pipe. So he becomes a professional piper. We, we can't prove that for Malcolm. So it, it's interesting to, to look at that as well. Um, that's an open-ended question at this stage. I don't have an answer for it, um, but it's, it's one that I'll certainly be looking into. So what do we actually know about Donald Ban? We know that he was born around about 1710 um, and, and that he was the son of the great Patragog uh, McCrimmon, um, who formally began the McCrimmon Piping School at Bororig. Um, so that's that's fairly certain. We, we can't really doubt it. Um, we also know that he was not the hereditary piper to MacLeod of Dunvegan. It was his older brother that was the hereditary piper. Um, he may have been a professional military piper in 1745 to 1746 in a detachment of the newly raised Loudoun's Regiment, um, under um, which was raised by, by MacLeod of Dunvegan, MacLeod of MacLeod. Um, he was almost certainly a, a part-time piper to MacLeod of Dunvegan at the Harris estate. So MacLeod of Dunvegan um, had had uh, land on Skye, um, Lewis and, and also Harris, um, and, it, uh, and, and Donald Ban was actually moved to, um, to, to Harris uh, in order to pipe, and he was given a discount on his rent there. We'll, we'll look at that in a little bit, um, but that, that's something that we, we certainly know about him. Um, his only known address was was over in in Harris, which was on uh, at Scarister. Um, so so that's the only place we have a record of him actually living. He appears to have been able to read and write, and to um, uh, and and by the seventeen uh, thirties he was certainly signing his name while witnessing MacLeod's Harris accounts. So that's very interesting, and it means that uh, we also know that he was quite important uh, for MacLeod uh, at, at Scarister and in, in the Harris estate um, because he's signing documentation. Um, we also know that his wife, Rachel, remained at Scarister until, uh, uh, after his death at Moy um, and received an annual pension from MacLeod of Dunvegan until the estate was actually sold in 1779. So... That again shows that there was um, a, a position of authority uh, that, that Donald Ban McCrimmon had. Um, it's very interesting indeed. What we also uh, have evidence of um, and, and would be very, very difficult to prove actually, is that um, Donald Ban probably had a girlfriend in, in Dunvegan at the same time as having a wife on Harris. Um, so while his wife was in Harris and and uh, and Donald Ban came to uh, Dunvegan, um, presumably to to serve MacLeod of Dunvegan, um, there was a lady there who had an affection for him um, and apparently wrote the the uh, lyrics to the the tune "I Will Never Return" Hatiel McCrumen. Um, now, that's jumping the gun quite a bit. Um, it's difficult to prove that. Uh, it's, it's also thought that the, um, uh, the the lyrics to the tune may have been written by his sister. Um, so it, it's not something that I'd be willing to, to um, conclude at, at this stage, but it, it is something that um, uh, does exist in, in certain folklore um, anyway. So another interesting aside about uh, Donald Ban there. So Scarister on Harris. Scarister House uh, was built in 1827. That's the house in the picture there. So it certainly wasn't there at the time uh, that Donald Ban was there. Um, but it's now a very nice hotel. If you want to book that for a tour uh, with Highland Historian, do get in touch. Andrew at highlandhistorian.com. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's it's there as a, an image um, uh, to, to represent um, the, the, the Harris estate. Um, uh, of the of the MacLeods, even though it was put there after they they sold it in 1779, so that was built in 1827. Um, the McCrimmons were uh, known at, at both Rodell um, on the south east coast of Harris and at Scarister in the south of Harris, um, right on the west coast. Uh, the only record of Donald Ban um, it, it, the, there is actually living as a tenant; it's not there as an official piper. Um, in 1707, a, a piper named Hugh MacLeod was paid a salary 
salary of £40 to be McLeod of Dunvegan's Piper on Harris. Very interesting indeed. Um, so we, we now have a, a different name, a different Piper uh, there in 1707 called Hugh McLeod. Um, and we also know his salary. So Malcolm McCrimmon um, uh, preceded Donald Ban as, as McLeod's uh, piper at Harris before returning to be the hereditary piper at, at Dunvegan on the death of his father, Patrick Ogg, in 1730. So it, it could be seen from that that the position of, of piper um, at, at, at Harris um, must have been uh, like the thing you did before you became the, um, uh, the, the, the piper to McLeod. So it was like a, a next in line thing. Um, uh, so perhaps that's why um, why why uh, Donald Ban was there. Perhaps he was the the next in line, but unfortunately he died before um, he was he was able to take that position. We we just don't know that. Um, but it's it's very interesting that uh, that that Malcolm um, was was brought back from Harris um, to to replace his father father Padraig Og in in 1730. Donald Ban took over from Malcolm um, in Harris. Uh, when that happened and moved to, to Scarister in 1730 our, uh, and, and that is our earliest record of him. Um, it was recorded that he came from Skye in order to move there so the story about having a girlfriend um, at Dunvegan um, perhaps that girlfriend was before he moved and he had to leave her to move there we, we just don't know. Um, he was a part-time piper on uh, on a salary of £28, 13 shillings and 4 pence. Um, so that's different to being the piper. Um, and that salary increased in 1738 to £33, 6 shillings and 8 pence. Um, so this was actually only half of his rent. So he had to make up the, the other half of his rent uh, by other means, um, either by fishing or growing food or, or something like that. Um, but we can see that he was also paid less than, than Hugh MacLeod, um, which is very interesting. Uh, one year, he even received a cow instead of half of his pay. So, um, you know, not not a great deal for uh for for Donald Ban. Um here's a, a lower salary than the other piper at Harris. Um and also oh, by the way we we can't afford your your um salary this year so we're we're going to give you a cow. Um it it shows that life would have been tough for him I think. Um you know a cow would have been a very useful thing but also um 33 pounds 6 shillings and 8 pence would have been uh, probably more useful um for 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 Donald Ban. Um, this gives rise to the claim that Donald Ban couldn't possibly have been the greatest of all pipers, as has been claimed in folklore, um, as he wasn't even the greatest of the pipers on Harris, and he certainly wasn't the greatest of the pipers in the in the MacLeod estates. Um, his his brother Malcolm presumably was. So Donald Ban is recorded as holding the position of piper on Harris from 1730 to 1745, um, meaning that he may have resigned uh, the post to become a military piper. So that's very interesting indeed. 1745 is when he um, he, he joins uh, uh, with with MacLeod's independent company, um, and he doesn't die until 1746. Um, so th th you've got to presume that he, he actually had to resign that post of a part-time piper um, in order to take up the military position, which again gives rise to, to my belief that, that he was a, a professional military piper at that time. Um, it, it's a very interesting thing indeed. A lot of that is is, is very difficult to, to prove um, uh, completely, but it, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I, I believe it, it proves beyond doubt many of those um, those theories that we've just discussed. If we look at MacLeod's involvement in the 1745 Rising, um, uh, he was clearly on the, the Hanoverian side. He raises um, uh, 700 men uh, for uh, from his Dunvegan and Harris estates uh, for, for that side. Um, just to give you a little note on uh, Norman MacLeod of, of MacLeod, uh, this is him in the, the image here. Um, he was known as the Wicked Man. Um, and there's various uh, stories about him which, which relate to that nickname. Um, but he left his estate £50,000 in debt, having spent the £60,000 he he'd already started with. So he, even if he didn't make any money in his life, he spent £110,000, but he must have made some money, so he spent even more than that. Um, and, and he left the estate uh, £50,000 in debt. Um, so his ancestors, um, unfortunately, had an awful lot of work to do to, to recover from his bad business decisions. 
Um, uh, fortunately for Dunvegan the Castle and the McLeod Estate, um, they, they appear to have, have, have done fairly well at, at recovering from that. Um, but that was Norman McLeod of McLeod. Um, it's it's thought uh, that two independent companies uh, were were raised. Um, that that was the seven hundred men, um, one from Dunvegan, one from Harris. Um, uh, how many men came from each and how they were split up? Um, it's it's difficult to say. Uh, but they were m raised by McLeod of McLeod. Um, and but only one of these actually formed part of Loudon's sixty fourth Highland Regiment, which is very interesting. Um, so the these two companies are obviously raised and then almost immediately split up. Up to, to different duties. It appears that Donald Bamber Crimmon was piping in one uh, independent company um, which was attached to uh, Loudoun 64th Highland Regiment and that Malcolm McCrimmon was piping in McLeod's own independent company um, which went with McLeod. Um, so what was his most notable action? Um, well it would appear that uh, that Norman McLeod of McLeod uh, his most notable action was actually being outflanked, outnumbered, and losing 50 men as prisoners and some killed at the Battle of Inverurie on the 23rd of December 1745. So as well as being a bad businessman, he also seemed to be a, a, a terrible military tactician um, because the, the decisions he made on the 23rd of December 1745 were, were pretty terrible in all honesty um so it, it it does appear that malcolm was was piper to the company uh, which marched with his master and that donald ban was was uh, probably with the other one um and it seems increasingly likely uh, as well when we consider the confusion over whether malcolm and donald ban were in the same place as uh, were the same person or even in the same place at the same time throughout the rising um, so that that's interesting to to bear in mind so we'll take a, a quick look at, at loudon's highlanders um it appears that uh, that Donald Ban's company um, of McLeod of Dunvegan's independent company uh, was was the one attached to um, uh, to Loudon's regiment, Loudon's sixty fourth Highlanders. The regiment's fortunes and favour varies dramatically in in accounts, uh, but few have remembered how important the regiment was for the introduction and survival of Gallic culture within the British Army. Um, I've put the question there on the slide: preserver of Highland culture by enthusiastically introducing it into a British Army format. Oof. That's a big question and a big debate, uh, one for another time for sure. Um, but it's 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 certainly a point of view um, which, which we can't ignore um, because it's 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 quite interesting how the development of Gallic culture within a British Army context um, uh, really begins and and to some extent flourishes after the 1745-1746 rising um, and and you know the the opposite side of that is that um, uh, what the the British army did was was massively destructive uh, to, to Gallic culture and Loudon himself was was part of that as well so it's 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 an interesting debate and um, but but one uh, certainly for another time and for another video as well um, after Fontenoy, the power and usefulness of Highlanders had certainly been noted and Loudon was commissioned to raise a regiment who would speak, act and dress as their culture dictated. Very interesting indeed. This included having pipers, of course, um, and it is also possible that Loudon introduced the diced hose that you see him uh, wearing in the picture there, um, which are still worn by military pipe bands even to this day which that that's quite remarkable and and that's something that uh that will uh, be part of, of um some of my my future um uh, writing on on the the subject as well uh, the regiment of around 300 men um, uh, soon soon became a collection of independent companies commanded by Loudon. So we already had two independent companies raised by McLeod, which were around 700 men. That's then split, um, and the entire of Loudon's regiment was around 300 men. But then that's then split into um, into independent companies as well. You can see why it gets a bit complicated. Um, but that that collection of independent companies of 300 men uh, was commanded by Loudon. Uh, the notion of having a regiment in battle soon faded um, for, for Loudon, um, and, and he was mainly directed into guerrilla style objectives um, and, and the garrison of strategic ba garrisoning of strategic bases like in Benes. Um, we must not overlook the fact that Loudon also had two formerly Jacobite individuals as pipers in his household after Culloden, which is very interesting. One who came to him from Lady Anne Mackintosh and one from MacDonald of Scotthouse's household. 
um, that is something that is is um, incredibly interesting uh, in terms of the the survival of, of Gallic culture after the the 1745 uh, Jacobite rising, um, and it also proves to some extent um, that that being a good piper was more important than than political uh, um, political sides. So yeah, very very interesting thing. Um, so we we know that two former Jacobites um, were were pipers to Loudon in his household after uh, the 1745 1746 rising. Christopher Duffy um, describes uh, Loudon as the unluckiest, uh, sorry, uh, as unlucky as a strategist, but an energetic and capable leader. Um, I think that's a very good uh, description of a man who um, didn't seem to get on too well when it came to, to real battle. <laughs> um, but he, he certainly was energetic um, and uh, he was certainly um, seen by many, um, uh, although predominantly relatives of his, uh, to be a capable uh, leader as well. We're now going to have a look at the development towards uh, the route of Moy um, and also the uh, the development of, of both Malcolm and Donoban uh, McCrimmon. Um, the confusion between Malcolm and Donoban really increases in their activity against the Jacobites. Uh, many confuse the reaction by Jacobite pipers at Inverurie um, with, the, with the death of Donoban at Moy. Um, but there is a chance, and it is only a chance, that both could be true. Um, the, the the idea is that the Jacobite pipers basically refused to play um, uh, either when Malcolm McCrimmon was a prisoner or when Donoban was killed. There is some storytelling that says that the Jacobite uh, prisoners, ref uh, Jacobite sorry pipers, refused to play after the Battle of Inverurie, um, where Donald Ban was taken prisoner, and that is an, an interesting. Um, uh, an interesting situation because I don't believe it can be true that both Malcolm and Donoban were at Inverurie. Um, and let's have a look at that. Um, so many confuse this. Uh, the Battle of Inverurie uh, took place on um, 23rd of December 1745 and here's a map to, to show it. Um, an extract of a contemporary account from the Culloden Papers says that MacLeod's resolute behaviour in running to the enemy with so few of his men about him and the stand they made with not one half of their little army against 900 till they were overpowered by numbers is much to his honour. Well, it might have been much to his honour, but it seems to me it was pretty stupid tactically. Um, so MacLeod of MacLeod obviously wasn't a great military tactician. Many were killed as a result of this, um, and around uh, 50 were taken prisoner, including Malcolm McCrimmon. We know that Malcolm was taken prisoner. So Malcolm's story um, develops like this. He was taken prisoner at Inverurie, is then taken as a prisoner to, to Stirling, um, and at Stirling, um, uh, the, the news gets out that, that he's uh, a prisoner, um, and the Jacobite pipers then refuse to play for a week and threaten to go on strike, uh, knowing that, that Malcolm was basically incarcerated, so they force his unconditional release um, as a prisoner to the Jacobites. Um, so that's one version of the story there, um, but despite many accounts claiming this, um, uh, it's it's almost impossible that Donald Ban could be the same individual that was captured at Inverurie on the 23rd of December 1745 and transported as a prisoner to Stirling and then was free to make it no north to Moy to be shot beside MacLeod of Dunvegan on the 16th or 17th of February 1746. Um, that's the that's the variation that that gets into a lot of the folklore history, um, and they they say that it was Donald Ban. I I just can't see how that could have been the case. Although he had returned to active service, Malcolm appears to have not been present at Moy, um, despite MacLeod being there with his detachment, and that again is a bit confusing. Why wasn't Malcolm with MacLeod after he's been released? Is it because he couldn't have got there in time? In which case, this idea of Donald Ban being the one that's captured at, at Inverurie um, can't be true because he couldn't have made it back either. Um, so you can see why, why there's these confusions that come out of this. Um, the Piper at Inverurie must surely have been uh, Malcolm. Malcolm was the better known, the hereditary Piper and the tutor at the McCrimmon School, not Donald Ban. So he would have been there with, with MacLeod. 
He's then taken prisoner and it appears that um, because Donald Bann is, is just what happens to be um, with the company that are, that are detached to Moy, uh, um, sent to Moy, that he is then the piper that pipes from a cloud there um, when, he, when his, his brother is still away. Um, there is also a slight chance that Malcolm had tutored or at the very least played alongside Donald Campbell, Peebeth Moore, Maca Glasserich. Uh, which may be why the Jacobite pipers reacted as they did. And that's an area of, of my future research on, on uh, piping during the Jacobite period as well. Um, but, you know, that that um, intensity of the, the Jacobite pipers' response uh, to, to Malcolm McCrimmon being um, captured, if indeed that's the, uh, the the variation of the story that we, we take, um, it seems likely that uh, uh, Donald Campbell must have met Malcolm McCrimmon at some stage. Um, and again, it shows that piping was was probably more important than, than politics at the time. Um, the Rout of Moy uh, took place in, in the night time of the 16th to the 17th of February 1746. Uh, this account that we can see here um, from Loudon appears to suggest that Donald Ban was at his, not MacLeod's side, when he was killed at Moy. So again, even in the information that we have available to us, we have questions over its accuracy. And it says, We marched to the heights above the water at Nairn, when to my infinite mortification, I uh, saw and heard about a mile on my left a running fire from the whole detachment, 30 men. They saw or imagined they saw four men, including the blacksmith, Donald Fraser, on which they made his, this fire. But the consequence on the main body was very bad, for it threw us into the greatest confusion. I got my regiment, at the head of which I was at the front, saved from falling out of the road. Oh, very heroic indeed. Uh, all faced where they saw the fire. They were ten men deep, all pressed, and a good many dropping shots. One which killed a piper at my foot while I was informing them. So that was John Campbell, 4th Earl of Loudoun, to the Earl of Stair. And that's his report written at Dornoch um, of the Rout of Moy. All sounds incredibly uh, heroic, doesn't it? Well, it's interesting because he seems to be saying there's a lot of uh, Jacobites firing at them and, and that he rallies his men. Um, there are questions as to whether he was even there certainly. Um, most of the accounts seem to suggest that it was MacLeod who was standing by the piper, uh, not, not the Earl of Loudoun. Um, and the other issue that we can draw from this is that we know um, from uh, corroborative evidence that there were not a lot of Jacobites involved. There was just a handful. And what they did um, incredibly well was they ran around in the dark and they shouted uh, various uh, clan um, war cries uh, which led the men they were facing um, Loudoun's regiment um, or Loudoun's company to believe that there were there were many regiments of Jacobites facing them um, so it's, it's it's a very interesting account and and it's one that doesn't really add up um, uh, but it shows that Loudoun was obviously trying to trying to sell us a, a story um, at that time. Alexander Mackenzie, in his History of the MacLeods, um, uh, uh, published in 1889, has it that Norman MacLeod was at the head of the advance guard at Moy. Mackenzie, however, also misrepresents Donald Bann as MacLeod's piper, which we already know wasn't the case in his telling of the tale. Um, MacLeod's appearance at Moy and the local tradition of there being 700 to 1,500 redcoat soldiers there um, suggest that both companies may have been together at this stage. So, so that again leads to a bit of um, uh, interesting debate as to, to whether Malcolm was there as well as Donald Ban, um, as to whether Loudon was in fact there. Um, uh, but certainly we, we know that MacLeod was there um, and we, we are pretty certain that he was the man that was standing beside Donald Ban when Donald Ban was killed. Um, so it's interesting on, on many different levels. So what the, were the repercussions of the Rout of Moy? In terms of the Jacobite perspective, this was a huge coup. Prince Charles Edward Stuart was saved from almost certain capture, and the story of what happened gave huge bragging rights uh, and propaganda material. Um, so Charles was at the time at, at uh, Moy House with Lady Anne Mackintosh, um, and the, 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 the route was a covering route 
um, uh, which was covering uh, Charles to escape. So that's why there were very few Jacobites involved in that um, and, and also why there was such a big force of Hanoverian soldiers sent to try and capture um, Charles as well. So that's uh, very interesting um, uh, that it gave huge bragging rights and also propaganda material to, to the Jacobites. Um, Lady Anne Mackintosh basically solidified her identity as a Jacobite heroine um, as, a, as a result of the Rite of Moy. The Earl of Loudoun was embarrassed uh, and this partly led to him being known for marching from defeat to defeat. Um, and it also explains to some extent why he may have been um, fabricating some tales into, into his report of what happened. Loudoun lost up to 200 men, mainly the Mackenzies from the Seaforth estate, who had been active Jacobites in 1715 and 1719, um, who immediately deserted. Um, MacLeod and or Loudoun was, was apparently ridiculed by other Hanoverian officers for losing his piper. A clear example of the lack of understanding of Gallic culture in the wider hierarchy of the British army at the time. Um, the, the Jacobites managed to take Inverness, pushing Loudoun into Ross and Cromarty, pursued by Mackenzie of Cromarty's regiment. Inverness and the possession of it was the major factor in the Jacobite decision to fight and, and uh, to hold um, um, to hold uh, the, the last remaining port of Inverness at Dromossi Moor two months later. Um, and that's something that I'll, I'll be posting um, uh, um, some, some deeper research on. Um, the, the fact was that uh, Dromossi Moor and the site of the Battle of Culloden was chosen to defend Inverness. However, we may choose uh, to view Donald Ban um, from the, the little we know um, uh, about him and his piping abilities it is his brother's reaction to his death which solidifies the conclusion that bagpiping and Gallic culture lost one of its most important champions. However, we choose to view Donald Ban as a Hanoverian piper. The Rout of Moy, in my opinion, was a disaster for Gallic musical culture. And it must be remembered as such. We have here a quotation um, which is something that um, I, I will be talking about a bit more when I, I post a video on the, the notion of doofus. Um, and this is that the Gael doesn't simply belong to his country as a user of that landscape in the here and now. He is part of it. And we've already seen today in, in this talk all the connections um, that, that seem to uh, go over the, the political situation of the time. The fact that pipers moved from household to household, the fact that pe pipers from both sides may have had um, uh, uh, discussions with each other, meetings with each other, shared tunes with each other. Um, it's, it's very important to our understanding of, of Dukas. Um, and the, the loss of Donald Ban um, in the ground at Moy um, has to be remembered as such. The tune that you're you're about to hear um, is the the ground in the first variation um, of of the lament for Donald Ban McCrimmon. This is the Pibrich. Um It is a much longer tune, but we're we're just going to have the the ground, um, which is the base of the tune, and then a little bit of the uh, the first variation. It does not appear in the Campbell Cantaract um, and is presumed to have been written by Malcolm, so the brother of Donald Ban. Um, it appears in Donald Mac uh, Macdonald's 1826 collection of Pibrich, uh, volume 2, as Cuva Govnal van Machrumen. Um, so a nice Gallic title. Um, so that basically means lament for Donald Ban Macrumen. Is this the earliest record? Well, possibly not, because Joseph Macdonald's notes on bagpipe composition, uh, written in 1760, follow a remarkably similar structure to the lament for Donald Ban Macrumen. We're now going to enjoy that tune, um, and and before we do, um, please remember that if you wish to book me for a, a, a lecture, a talk, um, a tour, or any research work, um, do feel free to email me at andrew at highlandhistorian.com or to check for more information at highlandhistorian.com. And here to play us out is Andrew McClendon. <laughs> 